Hi, welcome to the Tarun Stevenson Leadership Channel. I'm your host, Tarun Stevenson, and we are all about helping you lead, communicate, and grow to your full potential. Whether you're tuning in on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or your favorite podcasting app, don't forget to subscribe and follow so that you can stay up to date with all our latest episodes. All right, here's the latest episode. Let's get into it. Hey, everyone, Tarun here, and I am with uh, Brian Knight, who is a coach, author, publisher, and radio host host and he uh, runs Success Profiles magazine and radio show. Welcome, Brian, to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's so good to talk to you and you're in Arizona, is that right? That's correct. So we've got a little bit of a time difference, but thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Mm -hmm. We were having a chat just before uh, we got on this interview and just to get getting to know you because this is the first time I'm meeting you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us a little bit about your magazine and radio show so we can get sure. to know Brian, right? Oh, wonderful. So uh, my background is that I was a teacher at a two year business college back in the day. I taught public speaking, English composition and business math. And the commonalities between those courses was they were required. So people had to take my class. So I tried to make it as fun as possible. I've always been a teacher in my heart. And that has extended to my current career where I host a radio show called Success Profiles Radio, a magazine called Success Profiles Magazine. And I coach people through writing their book. And I even ghostwrite for people who prefer that I do it all. So my overall mission is to inspire, motivate, and help people become the best versions of themselves and help them to create their legacy. Great. I, I love that phrase. And we're going to unpack that as we have this conversation about creating legacy, because that is so important as a leader to understand that everything you are doing is yeah. building a legacy to pass on to the next generation. But why don't you tell us a little bit about your magazine and your book? It's called success. Uh, so your magazine and your radio show It's called success profiles. And you have the opportunity mm-hmm. of engaging with uh, people who have really I guess, achieved uh, a great deal of success in their business or leadership endeavors. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I started my radio show in January, 2012. So my nine year anniversary is coming up and I just celebrated my 400th episode. Thank you. I just celebrated my 400th episode a couple of weeks ago. So I interview high achieving people, learn what they did, what they overcame and the lessons we can learn and unpack through their journey. It's always better to learn from someone else's mistakes than to make our own, even though we all do make our own. And so that's all good and fine. In fact, I'm taping two episodes of my show uh, tomorrow. So that way I have some shows that can run over the Christmas break. So one of them will be Jeff Timmons from 98 degrees. That's he's scheduled to appear tomorrow and that show will run in a couple of weeks. So yeah, I've gotten to interview some really great people, Jack Canfield and Mark Fedra Hansen, who co-wrote uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. I interviewed them mm-hmm. separately. I've interviewed Darren Hardy from Success Magazine. I've interviewed um, Kevin Harrington, who appeared on Shark Tank. Uh, Sharon Lecter, who co-authored Rich Dad, Poor Dad with Robert Kiyosaki and has written a bunch of other books too. So a lot of really great people. Uh, Stedna Graham, uh, he runs a nonprofit with his business partner and He's very famously attached to Oprah. So I got to interview him uh, about a year ago. So I've gotten to interview some really great people and I get to learn from them. So I ask the kinds of questions that I would ask if I was just having a private meeting with them, a coaching session. And I think of it as having a coaching session in front of the world. So I ask questions I would want to know. And I ask questions that other people, I think other people would want me to ask. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's such a, such a privilege to be able to pick the brain of uh, such notable uh, personalities as that. What would you say has been a common theme as you've interviewed many of these successful people from such a wide variety of fields? Yeah. What would you say a common theme about their success has been that comes through in those conversations? They have an unbreakable belief in themselves and their yeah. purpose. Yeah. When things get tough, A lot of people will quit, but if you remember why you started, if you have a strong enough why, like Napoleon Hill talks about in Think and Grow Rich, having a burning desire, then you are destined to make your achievement happen if you don't give up. And a lot of people cite Think and Grow Rich as one of their inspirations for their personal development journey. Yeah. 
And so, so talk about that because having a why, having a purpose is such a common theme that you hear in the personal development space. But I think uh, a lot of people perhaps hear that but don't really understand what it means to know your why or even how yeah. to discover your why. What have you found have been the, the steps that can be taken to discover your why? Yeah, it took me a while. And some people never discover it, sadly enough, but you have to think about what, what can change in your life if you do the thing that you say you want to do. I mean, a lot of people are very interested in doing something, but not a lot of people are committed yeah. to doing something. And the true test of commitment is how, what will it take to make you give up on your dream? Yeah. If it doesn't take you much to give up on your dream, then you're not really committed to it. You're just yeah. interested. It's a passing thing. It's a fad. It's mm -hmm. the flavor of the month. But you, you have to have a very strong why. Let's just say, for example, someone wants to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. If their reason for stopping smoking is so that they can still be here when their little girl gets married someday, mm -hmm. that's a strong enough why. You want to see your little girl get married, yeah. right? I stopped drinking soda about six years ago. And mm -hmm. my reason why was I watched a video of Diet Coke being poured onto a corroded car battery and it just, you just melted that corrosion away. And I thought, oh, wow, if Diet Coke does this to a corroded car battery, what is it doing to my stomach yeah. and everything inside my body? Wow. That, that was my moment. I no longer had a desire. I mean, that really was my moment. So the key for me was to find something else to drink instead. So I went to lemonade yeah. and I did that for a few months and realized lemonade's got a lot of sugar in it. <laughs> so then I went to water and I would occasionally pivot to lemonade, but now I drink Arizona green tea sometimes. And I drink water almost all the time. I go through almost a gallon of water a day. Yeah. And so you had those, those pivotal moments, which really, I guess you could say shocked you into making change for yourself. And right. you use the example of uh, not smoking because you want to see your daughter get married. Yeah. Uh, I've encountered, I'm probably in my own life too, but some people who struggle to really get past those uh, habits that hold them back. Sometimes they have a dream, but perhaps the dream is too ethereal or too out of touch. You know, your daughter's five years old and she won't be married till she's in her twenties perhaps. So you sort of keep making re excuses or reasons. Well, you know, I'll, I'll quit. I will quit eventually or I'll quit soon. Yeah. And you keep pushing that uh, moment back because it doesn't yeah. feel real enough. How do you, yeah. How do you find those catalyst moments other than when they just happen to you uh, without your knowing, how do you create a catalyst moment that will propel you into action when uh, the, the tendency is to just make excuse or yeah. to push it back? Yeah. Well, thankfully I've never had to deal with the smoking thing. Cause that's never, mm. ever been something I've wanted to do, yeah. but I would say, let's just say, for example, you're, you're running your business mm and you're making decisions, there is a cost, an opportunity cost for doing something. Yeah. And there's also a cost for not doing something. Yeah. And so now you have to start thinking in those terms. If yeah. you, for example, want to quit smoking, mm. what is the, what is the opportunity cost if you stop smoking? Well, or, or, you know, what, what is the benefit? Yeah. Well, you're saving X number of dollars a month because cigarettes are very, very expensive. Mm. Think about how much money you can save over that 15 years and think instead about what you can do with that extra money built yeah. up over 15 years. You can invest in a home, you can invest in stocks, you can start an e-commerce store. And of course you're incrementally adding to your total, but mm -hmm. you're investing mm -hmm. in something that will outlast you. Yeah. You're investing in an asset like Robert Kiyosaki says, mm -hmm. you know, if you're investing or, not, or spending money on, let's just say cigarettes, cause that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, that's money that you'll never get back because you, you smoke your cigarettes and they're done. You have nothing to show for it except being satisfied for a few minutes, I guess. Yeah. And for people who smoke two packs a day, that, that comes up over and over and over and over again every day. Mm. That's a lot of money. Yeah. But how much money can you save if you spent it on something else? Yeah. So it has to feel real for you. If you're interested in building wealth, 
and this is one of your habits and there's no judgment here. I'm just simply logically laying it out. Yeah. If, if you want to build wealth and you've got a income goal or a net worth goal, but you're spending money doing all these other things, what could you be doing with that money instead? That's all yeah. I'm saying. Great. Great. I watched a documentary not long ago that was comparing the insurance industry to the gambling industry mm -hmm. and how they work off a psychological uh, balancing scale in our head that we, we have a tendency to um, be motivated by fear more readily than we do by gain. And that's how the insurance industry works. The fear of yeah. loss motivates mm -hmm. us to get insurance, but there's a tipping point where if the gain is big enough, we will suspend our fear of loss for the sake of gain. And that's how the gambling industry works. The, the payoffs are big enough. Uh, so what you're talking about sounds like to me that you've really got to, if, if the fear is not motivating you enough, you've got to stack the gains high enough where it actually feels real to you. I think those were the words you use. If you're, yeah. if you're going to be motivated by a dream, the dream has to become a reality in mm -hmm. the now before it becomes a why and it can actually yeah. drive you to change your habits. Is that really what you're talking about there? I think so. Yeah. And there's a really great book that I'm going through. I do have it sitting right here. Have you ever heard of the book called Atomic Habits by James Clear? I've heard of it. I haven't read it though. I'm partway through this. I'm not okay. as far along as I want to be, great. but it's really great. If you, if you want to talk about breaking habits and establishing new habits, this is a really mm -hmm. great book. Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I think it was a number one New York Times bestseller. Fantastic. I'll have to look that up for sure. Yeah. Atomic Habits. Great. So once you've established, I guess, a reason or a why or a motivating factor, and you've got that catalyst to a point where you're willing to act on it, what would you say the next steps are in somebody achieving or starting to move towards those goals? Is there a process that you go through of making a plan and stepping it out? Yeah, I think it depends on what it is that you're trying to do, but you mm -hmm. should have a plan. Mm -hmm. You should figure out what you're going to say yes to and what you're going to say no to. Yeah, that's really important because if you don't sure. identify what you should be saying no to, then you're going to just do those things mm -hmm. if they aren't on your radar. So what are you going to say yes to instead? And what are you going to say no to? And just have have a plan. And, and part of that plan might be uh, planning your environment. Who are you going to hang around with? If you're trying to quit smoking and you're, all of your friends smoke, you might want to minimize your exposure to those people while you're trying to quit smoking because sure. they won't be supportive. They'll say, well, wh why are you trying to change? Because mm -hmm. here's the thing. When you try and change and you're around other people who don't want to change, they will try and make you feel really uncomfortable about your new yeah. plan because they feel bad because they, yeah. just, they don't have a plan. Mm. Yeah. Jim, Jim Rowan says you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And I, yep. I don't think you can underestimate the power of the friends that you put in your life when you're trying mm -hmm. to make change. They, they really do have a, a huge impact on it. What, right. what is an experience that perhaps you've had as you've made changes in your life where you've seen uh, the way in which family members or friends have actually uh, had a detrimental effect on your progress and you've had to modify uh, those mm. relationships to help you. Yeah. I think I've been pretty lucky. If, if mm. I have a goal, my family is usually really supportive. In right. fact, last winter, my parents spent a couple of months in Arizona. They brought their RV and they camped and I went to go see them on the weekends right. and I was trying to do a weight loss mm. campaign and I was really successful with it last year. Then when they arrived in the winter time, I mean, they, you eat mom's cooking, right? Oh, and you just, that's, you just do that. You yeah. have to. And so I modified my plan where I would eat really well Monday yeah. through Friday. And then I would eat mom's cooking on Saturday and Sunday. Sure. Sure. So I, I modified my plan. So yeah, great. I, I still made some progress, not as much as I would have, but again, when mom's a good cook and mom is still in your <laughs> life, you eat mom's cooking when she's in Absolutely. front of you. So yeah. Absolutely. So you've got to be flexible in your plan. You yeah. can't be so rigid that if, uh, so if real life happens, that it makes you fall off your wagon. You, you, you've mm -hmm. got to have some flexibility in, in, in uh, modifying for the way life goes. Yeah. Right. 
Fantastic. So you talked about a lot of these successful people that you interview uh, have this unstoppable determination that uh, really drives them despite the obstacles. And you know, anyone that's gone after their dream knows that failure is a reality of progress. You're, you're going to fail. You're going to hit roadblocks. What are some of the, uh, I guess, characteristics that you've learned about overcoming obstacles and overcome, getting up after failure? Well, I, I think Zig Ziglar talks very famously about how failure is not a person, it's an event. Mm. So if something doesn't work out, it doesn't mean you failed. It means that the thing you did fail. Great. And I think that's a really important distinction because you can start over again from where you are. Yeah. And I think it's really important that we don't compare someone else's chapter 20 to our chapter one. Good people who are really successful just figured it out before you did. And that's really it. They are no more special than you are, or I am. They just figured it out earlier than we did. And that's really the only difference. And so what is the smart thing to do? You ask them what they did and people who are genuinely interested in helping people and being, and being successful, they'll pass it on. They'll, they'll tell you what they did. Now, if you want them to tell you how they did it, you might have to pay them for that because mm -hmm. they're probably a coach sure. or they probably spent thousands and thousands of dollars and thousands and thousands of hours learning to do what yeah. they did. And they shouldn't be giving that away unless they want to. Mm. So yeah, I guess the other thing too is to start a show and get them on your show and ask them what they did. So true. Very right. good. Very good. So, so talk, unpack that a little bit more for me because I, I think you really hit on something there about comparison. And I think in a social media yeah. generation that we have, you're very often seeing other people's highlight reel and comparing yeah. it to your real life. And it's yep. so easy to get stuck in that comparison trap. I mean, you mentioned you've, you're coming up on your 400th show. Mm -hmm. I started this podcast in March and I'm coming up on my 35th show. And, Good. you know, yeah. So, it, yeah, I'm proud of that achievement because that totally. was a goal for me. But at the same time, if I was to get stuck in comparing myself to your progress, right. it's going to make me feel like a failure. And so what are some of the things that you can advise uh, perhaps people who get stuck in this comparison trap maybe on social media or just, you know, they're feeling like they're struggling. How, how can yeah. you play that mind game so it doesn't right. defeat you before it needs to? Well, we are all human. If you only see somebody's highlight reel, you should also know that they went through a lot to get yeah. where they are. They had to learn a lot, which means that bad things happen and they had to figure out what to do. They had to figure out how to navigate through that. They probably paid a coach multiple coaches. Yeah. They probably got their experience and we know that bad experience comes from making bad decisions, right? Yeah. So that is going on. They just don't yeah. always tell you that part. So yeah. don't get stuck in comparing yourself to somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's it's so true and I I've observed this of the the youtube trend of youtube content creators where a lot of people who are very f successful at youtube content creation if you watch enough of their videos you realize they've been doing it for 10 years yeah but they've only become famous in the last two mm -hmm. and there's, there's this whole back catalog of failed videos and failed topics that they don't talk about anymore mm -hmm. and nobody knows about and you can get really stuck if you think that you're going to become like them overnight yeah. and uh, get really discouraged. No, that's, good. that's great advice, Brian. Thank you for that. So let, let's move this conversation on to what we originally wanted to talk about, and that's creating legacy, because that's a real passion for you. Tell me about what your understanding of creating a legacy means and why it is so important for leaders and entrepreneurs to understand. Right. Legacy for me means creating something that will outlive you. Writing books is a great way of doing that. Mm. Podcasting is a great way of doing that. For musicians, recording their work is a great way of doing that. Elvis is no longer with us, but people still listen to him. Yeah. If they've got his albums, if they've got his CDs, or if they go visit Graceland, something, there's just something about the mystique of Elvis. There's something about the mystique of Michael Jackson. There's something about yeah. the mystique of John Lennon. They mm. created something that will benefit people for generations to come. Yeah. I'm not putting myself on the scale of any of those people, sure. but what I want to do is create content so that when I'm gone, 
people can still read my books. They can still read what I was thinking. They can read the interviews mm -hmm. of the really amazing people that I had a chance to interview. I mean, this is one mm -hmm. of them, Success Profiles, Conversations with High Achievers. It's on mm -hmm. Amazon, but I interviewed Jack Canfield, Tom Ziegler, Laura Langmeyer, and quite a few more. Great. And so I'm helping them capture their message for years to come yeah. going on. And they are all published authors themselves. And so it's all about just creating a body of work, which is a philosophy, which is what you want people to remember about you and remember about success and living a great mm. life and creating a great impact going forward on their audiences. Yeah. So I help people do that. I have right. my radio show where I interview people. I have my magazine where I invite people to contribute to the magazine. Mm -hmm. I am a ghostwriter. I help people write their books. And I also coach people through writing their books if they want to do it themselves with mm -hmm. some gentle nudging from me occasionally. Great. Right. So how yeah. important is it when you're creating a legacy to think about the benefit or the impact it has on the, the people that come after you? Yeah. I mean, I could leave something like a statue or a monument as an edifice to my existence, but that doesn't <laughs> necessarily benefit anybody. Is there, is there an importance to benefiting others with your legacy? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we read, we read Napoleon Hill. We read Thank and Grow Rich. That's a legacy for yeah. those of us who didn't get to meet him in person, for those of us who are not old enough to have met him in person. Yeah. Yeah. So that work has benefited people for the last several generations and it yeah. continues to do so. It's one of the best selling books ever. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. I mean, what he did is he interviewed some of the most successful people in the world during his time. Mm -hmm. And he spent 20 years doing that and he wrote the book. And yeah. for anyone who's not read Think and Grow Rich, I really strongly recommend that you, yeah. you do because it's just phenomenal and it's about training your mind to think success. Yeah. And when you have a burning desire as one of his principles is, mm. uh, and formulate a plan and you have specialized knowledge, yeah. you can't help but do very well in life if you apply the principles. Yeah. So good. And Napoleon Hill is a great example. I read a story once of um, him when he was, he wrote the book initially and he was doing a book signing in a bookstore and in came the founder of Ford Motor Company and made a comment, looked at his book and made a comment and said, if you actually knew how to think and grow rich, you wouldn't be standing here in this bookstore uh, trying to peddle your book. You'd already be rich. And it's an interesting, uh, anecdote and I, I wonder if at the time that would have been probably pretty discouraging to Napoleon Hill yet I think Napoleon Hill gets quoted more and referenced more in the sense of people bettering themselves and empowering themselves to live their best life than Henry Ford ever did mm -hmm. uh, although you know you, you hear plenty of quotes from Henry Ford and people drive his cars but Napoleon Hill has really established a legacy that impacts people personally that has gone far outlived his own existence, despite what some of the detractors might have thought. What do you, what do you think about that? I think, I think that's absolutely true. And I think both of them have created a legacy yeah. that have outlasted them. I mean, yes, yeah. a lot of people drive his cars and a lot of people mm. read Napoleon Hill's books mm. and the Napoleon Hill foundation is still a force in this mm. world. My friend Don Green runs a Napoleon Hill Foundation yeah. and he's got access to unpublished works, letters, everything. And mm. so they occasionally publish new work that hasn't been published before or work yeah. that's being reworked or updated for the modern day. So, sure. so yeah, it's, it's mm. fantastic. I mean, what a great legacy to leave. So, so powerful. So powerful. So talk about, I mean, you're part of your, work is to help people write books. Why mm -hmm. is writing a book such a powerful way to leave a legacy? I mean, in the day yeah. of video and podcasting, where it seems like reading has become a, a trend that is fading, if you like, yeah. with the younger generation, why do you think writing a book still has so much power in leaving a legacy? Yeah. Well, writing a book can also be an audio book too. 
So yeah, sure. for those people who enjoy listening more, you create the mm. audio version of it. Great. But people still do love to read, whether it's their Kindle, whether it's a physical book. I love having a physical copy of a book to just yes. thumb through. Yes. There's just something very magical about having it in your hands Great. and carrying it with you. I mean, if I lost my electronic device with all of my books on it, I'm, I'm in a bad place. Yeah. But I can only lose one book at a time. And I can yeah, always go sure. buy it again if I have to. So it's it's just great. I love I love reading. And so a lot of people still identify with books. And it's a bucket right. list item. Yeah. A lot of people want to write a book. In fact, mm. the New York Times, a study, study in the New York Times mm. uh, cited that over 81% of the people, at least in the United States, want to write a book. But, you know, fewer than 1% actually ever do. Yeah. And so it's something that people dream about. Maybe they don't have time. Maybe they don't think they're a good writer. Or more importantly, maybe they don't think they have something legitimate to say. Well, yeah. you do. Everyone has okay. a message. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out what that is. And no one can figure that out for you. Okay. So, so tell us about that. Because I, I, I read a statistic once that there's something like a million books published every year. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty crowded uh, industry. And yeah. you, you, know, you talk about people questioning whether they have something worthwhile yeah. saying. What, what would yeah. you say to people like that? Yeah. Well, most people don't sell very many copies of their book because no, they don't know how sure. to market it. Yeah. Their friends and family will buy it, but then who else cares? Sure. And I tell people that it's like, if you really want to write a book, you need to have a plan of marketing. You need to have a yeah. plan. And since I work with entrepreneurs, I tell people have an end game in mind. You think about mm. Robert Kiyosaki's rich dad, poor dad. Mm his whole agenda is to sell his cash flow game. He provides tons and tons of value. Yeah. But if you read the book far enough, you realize that he's dropping little sprinkles of mm. his cash flow game okay. and encouraging you to get it and to play it with your family okay. so that you can learn how money actually works because most people didn't grow up learning how money really works the way that yeah. he's teaching it. Sure. And so his cash flow game helps to do that. Now I still have not played cash flow. I would like to someday. Sure. But uh yeah, it's the book is fantastic. Hmm. It is. And uh, I mean really for Robert Kiyosaki, uh, he uses books to open up markets in, in yeah. different areas. So he'll research a market and then he'll write a book about it and just open mm -hmm. up and and it positions him as an expert if you like mm -hmm. or an authority in that field. Um right. How does somebody perhaps who wants to become an authority or become an expert in a field really put their mark on something when perhaps that field is already dominated by so many other well-known profiles? Yeah. Is it worth entering those kinds of markets? It can be. I mean, if there, there's something that is unique to you and that is your, your unique experience and your story and your spin on it, no one else has your stories. No one else has your examples. Yeah. Now you can cite other people's work in your book. And so by association, you're attaching yourself to them. So sure. what you can also do is market your books in ways that other people don't. So you can be memorable. You can speak on stages, whether they're live or virtual, you can host events, you can host mastermind retreats. You can have a coaching program around your area of expertise. In fact, yeah. before COVID, I was doing bookstore signings for, mm -hmm. for this book at Barnes yeah. and Noble stores. One of my guests on my radio show wrote a book called The Legacy Letters. Hmm. And basically it was a set of letters to his children that contained his wisdom. Love it. And he, the, his children were young when he wrote the book, but he hmm. thought, what if I'm not here by the time they're all grown up? How will they know what their dad was thinking? How will they know what their dad's advice would be on a lot of various topics? And yeah. so he wrote The Legacy Letters. And so basically each chapter was a letter to his children about you know, so dating good. or going to school or how to find a job or how to deal with conflict or whatever. Yeah. It was a cool concept for a book, but he, his, his brand was that he called himself the cowboy philosopher. Right. And so, you know what he did for a book signing? He Come. signed books while sitting on a horse. <laughs> Christ. It was memorable, but still within his brand. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I like it. So yeah. really, we're not talking about uh, necessarily mimicking other people. You've got to find your own yeah. voice in this and, and bring mm -hmm. your own experience into the conversation and mm -hmm. knowing that there will be somebody that resonates with you and mm -hmm. you've got something to say despite yeah. the market you may be in. 
Right. And I tell people, the longer you wait to write your book, the longer someone who needs you does not get to experience who you are and what right. you have to say. So yeah. write your book. Time is going to pass. Let's go. Yeah. Write your book. So good. So yeah. good. So good. That's good motivation for me. I've got two books on the go at the moment and I need to get them done. So good motivation. Good. Yeah. Let's go. Excellent. Excellent. So, all right. So talk to me about, I've got a number of business owners uh, that listen to this podcast and there's also leaders from the education space. So school principals and, um, and then we've got church leaders. Uh, why would it be important for people in those spheres to actually write something? You know, let's say a business owner who's thinking, well, I've, I've got enough on my plate trying to run my business. Who has mm -hmm. time to write a book and what would be the benefit of it? Sure. Think about this. Let's just say that you're an auto mechanic, for example. Yeah. And let's just say, for the sake of example, there are five other auto mechanics in your town. If you live in a big city, there will be a lot more than five, but let's mm. just say five. Yeah. Someone who's considering finding a mechanic and they don't know anybody, maybe they're new in town. If you are the only one of those five that has a book, yeah. you, are the, you are perceived as the authority. Yeah. So you can write a book about the importance of car maintenance without making it sound like a, an owner's manual because those are boring and no one reads those anyway, right? Yeah. Unless you need something, there's something wrong with my cars or something in the manual that says what I do now, but you don't yeah. read it. It's like reading the dictionary. Who sits around and yeah. reads the dictionary? Yeah. So it's a credibility piece. And it's also something that you can give away as a value add to your customers. I mean, you fixed my car and you're giving me a book. How so, cool are you? Yeah. I'm going to tell all my friends that you brought, you gave me a book after yeah. you were done working on my car. It's like yeah. no one else does this. So that's the thing. You're creating a wild moment. You're creating an authority space in somebody else's head. And that's really important. Great. That's awesome. That's such good advice. Yeah. And so Moving on from the book sort of thing, uh, wh what would you recommend to leaders who want to start creating a legacy beyond necessarily writing a book, but yeah. what are some other ways you've alluded to doing a podcast or having a mm -hmm. vlog or something like that? What are some other ways that as leaders, we can establish our legacy and really create something of value for the next yeah. generation? Do videos, whether they're yeah. on YouTube whether they're on Facebook, whether they're on LinkedIn, but do videos around your area of expertise. When I released my book, what I did to promote my book, since I interviewed 11 people for that book, I did a Facebook Live every day for about a month. I would grab one golden nugget from one chapter and do an entire Facebook Live about that. And then I'd pick another chapter and pick one golden nugget from that chapter and do a five to seven minute Facebook Live on that. So good. And... After I got done doing all 11 chapters, I'd go back to chapter one and pick a different nugget that I learned from that speaker. I could go on forever mm. creating videos. Mm. I stopped mm. after about a month. <laughs> but but do, do videos based around your Arab expertise. Yeah. Go on television, be on podcasts like this, mm. where you have a chance to talk about what you're passionate about and what you're really good at. Do mm. blogs like you mentioned. Uh, start a coaching program. There are people who maybe want to learn how to do what you're doing. Mm. I've got a videographer friend who I've been telling forever, you need a coaching program because you, you can't be everywhere. You're in your local market. Mm. So teach other videographers how to start a business around their skill. Great. Yeah. yeah. So just a few ways that you can branch out and create your legacy. Great. Love it. Brian, uh, I've so enjoyed talking to you on uh, creating a legacy. Is there any last uh, pieces of wisdom you'd like to leave with our listeners today who are pondering their legacy and how they, they can level up in their success? Yes. Just get started. Yeah. Your first time is not going to be perfect. It won't be. I remember the first issue of my magazine that I created. I was very proud of it in the moment and rightfully so. Now that I'm working on issue number 37, three years later, I look back at that first one and think, oh, there's some things I would probably do differently had I known. Mm -hmm. In fact, your first thing might be cringeworthy, but don't let mm -hmm. it stop you. You'll get better at it. So just start. Somebody will hear you. Your tribe will find you. Mm -hmm. People will start sharing it. In fact, when I started doing my radio show, it took a while for me to find an audience, but after about a year and a half, PR firms started reaching out to me and started recommending their clients as guests for my show. And now most of my guests from my show come to me through PR agencies and referrals. Mm. 
Mm. So I don't have to do a lot of hunting anymore, yeah, which is really so, nice. Yeah, it's great. That's really good. And so what, what about people who are perfectionists or perhaps mm-hmm. get um, paralysis from overthinking the getting started part? You know, they don't want to get started until it's just perfect. What's your advice for them? It will never be just perfect. Yeah. It'll never be just perfect. In fact, I'll tell you what, when I started my magazine, I bought the domain name for successprofilesmagazine.com two or three years before I actually did something with it. I was renewing it for the third year Mm. and I realized I was paying for something that I wasn't doing anything with. And so I got convicted. Okay, I have to, I have to, I can't keep talking about doing a magazine someday. I didn't want to be that guy who kept talking about, I'm going to do this someday and then never do it. So I made myself start. And so the first thing I thought was, well, who can I put in the cover? Why I interviewed Kevin Harrington six months prior. So I emailed him. I said, Kevin, thank you once again for being on my show a few months ago. I'm doing something new. I will use part of the interview from our show as the feature article. And you don't need to do anything except send me some great photos. And an hour and a half later, he emailed me back and said, I'm in, let's go. Awesome. So good. Yeah. So just start. It doesn't have to be perfect. It really doesn't. Done is better than perfect. I love it. Such good advice, Brian. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, tell us where people can find you and the Success Profile brand. If they want to talk to you about book authoring or talk yeah. to you about your radio show, where can people find you? My website is briankwright.com. Okay. briankwright.com and everything that I'm doing is there. There is a contact form. And if you already know that you want to talk about writing a book or having me coach you through that, Hmm. you can go to callwithbrian.com and get on my calendar. Great. So briank.com and callwithbrian.com. Briankwright.com. Uh-huh. Awesome. We are going to put a link for your website there and uh, just make sure people can get a hold of it. But Brian, thank you so much for your time today. It's been great talking to you. Thank you, Tarun. It's been fun. All right. All the best. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you got a ton of value out of that episode. Don't forget to let us know what you thought in the comments. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover next time, we'd love to hear from you. If you know anyone that would benefit from the content that we produce, please like and share this channel. And we look forward to having you next time on the Tarun Stevenson Leadership Channel.